Rotorua. Uh, and uh, so I'm the last speaker. I should say this has been a terrific conference so far. All kinds of ideas. I've learned a lot. It's been so good. It's been so good. And I'd like to thank, take the opportunity to thank the, the organizers, everybody's organizer, in particular, Francois, who has put it all together. So thank you, and thank you, Francois. Okay, reduce or eliminate. In fact, I, I've been getting anxious about this talk because I'm, I'm supposed to be a physicalist. I think that there is conscious. I'm a phenomenal realist physicalist. And I thought that I'd have Keith and Dan uh, uh, denying consciousness. And I, my role is going to say, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. But I listened to them yesterday and I didn't hear them denying anything that I don't want to deny too. And I was getting, getting worried. I mean, he said, what he wants to deny is the idea of phenomenal properties that are separate from additional to the physical brain. And I thought, well, I mean, I've been denying those for, for a long, long time. And Dan said he wanted to deny the notion that there's colors literally as part of our, our sensory experiences. And I thought, well, I've, I've just written a whole book uh, entirely focused on that question, uh, denying that that makes any, any, any sense. And in fact, Keith actually said he didn't want to deny consciousness. And I was thinking, well, actually, Keith, I, I don't see why you shouldn't. In fact, I mean, uh, I think it's perfectly cogent. I mean, I don't think it's particularly advisable, but I don't think there's anything incoherent about it. So I was finding myself in a position that I was more illusionist than Keith and Dan. And I thought, what am I, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm, I'm on the wrong, wrong side. Fortunately, Francois came along uh, this morning and uh, gave a wonderful and cogent defense of a real, real uh, uh, illusionist position. I mean, he, he took a lot of care, which I will just borrow uh, uh, to identify what he thought of as an innocent concept of consciousness, not this highly charged philosophical notion, a notion which I take it as being used by other people outside philosophy, everyday people, uh, uh, scientists, and he, and he gave an elegant defense of why we should deny, deny that. And so I should stick to the, okay. And so, now actually I, I, I'm not gonna argue is anything incoherent about that, that position, uh, but I don't think that it's mandatory in the way that Francois suggested it was. So, so I'm at least I've got somebody to the for right. That's all right. I've got somebody to write to me. I am more illusionist than Keith and possibly Dan. I don't know what Dan thinks about denying the innocent notion of, of consciousness, but uh, 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 I'm going to be somewhere in between those who say you don't have to deny it, and those like Francois who say you do. Okay. So here's the plan. I've got an introduction. I'm kind of halfway through an introduction, but I've got a few more introductory things to say. And then I'll be talking about various kinds of conceptual indeterminacy. Uh, uh, borderlines, indeterminacies, I'll say a bit about morality, and then I'll focus on illusionism itself. So Keith's talk yesterday was all about how to be deflationist about consciousness. I mean, don't, don't take it too seriously. There's nothing there over and above the physical goings on. And I find myself, and, and he drew various uh, 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 important, uh, and it seems to me perfectly uh, correct uh, uh, consequences from that. And I find myself agreeing with everything he said, uh, apart from the first thing he said, which is that you mustn't deny that there's consciousness. And part of what I'm going to say is I don't think that's that's ruled out by any any strict demands. So I mean I agree that there isn't anything more to consciousness than physical goings on, and we should think hard about what follows from that. And in fact, uh, there are a lot of implications I think for the so-called science of consciousness that follow from that that aren't sufficiently appreciated. Okay, I think, and I've held this ever since I started thinking about consciousness that many people think that consciousness is non-physical. Uh, I've 
for a long time talked about the intuition of dualism, but it's not just me, many people outside philosophy talk about intuitive dualism, the fact that everyday people, perhaps in all societies, have a strong attraction to dualism, they find it hard to believe physicalism. Uh, uh, people outside philosophy give various explanations for that, people inside philosophy, including me, give explanations for that. Uh, I, I think that, that, that there's a strong tendency in human thought to think that dualism must be true and physicalism not. But I don't want to take it for granted that that's built into the definition of consciousness. I mean, if it were built into the definition of consciousness, that consciousness has to be non-physical, then of course we physicalists should deny it. But it's not obvious to me that that's to be built in. Francois argued that it is built in, and uh, I'm going to address that issue uh, at, in the last part of my talk. Is it built in or not? Uh, now, I'm going to say at the end, there's no fact of the matter about that. That's going to be my take home message. So my eventual verdict will ap appeal to a particular way in which the concept of consciousness is indeterminate. But before I get to that, I want to, to look at a couple of other ways in which the concept of consciousness is indeterminate, partly because that will point to various ways in which we need to be deflationary about consciousness, not take it over seriously. Uh, uh, I'll point out these other ways in which uh, uh, consciousness, the concept of consciousness is indeterminate, do not give you any, any uh, 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 reason to be, to be uh, uh, eliminativist, illusionist, eliminativist about consciousness. And then I'll put these other kinds of uh, indeterminacy to one side. So let me start. Timing. I should finish about five. Yeah, we weren't too late tonight. Something like that. Okay. Uh, first section: borderlines. So, is consciousness sharp? This is an issue which which uh, uh, is getting increasing amounts of attention. Uh, I've seen a few nice papers coming through the journals, being sent to me to to review, and then Michael Tai has just written a book. I think, what's it called? Vagueness and Consciousness. I think. Uh, and uh, he starts with the thought that surely, it's a surely ring ding, uh, uh, surely, surely consciousness is sharp. Surely there's a, a clear dividing line. Let, let, let's take the obvious uh, dimension as we, as we move up the, the uh, dimension of increasingly complex animals, that uh, uh, viruses aren't, well, not viruses aren't animals, but uh, as you move up life, uh, viruses aren't conscious, uh, 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 worms aren't conscious, are they? Uh, uh, shrimps aren't conscious. I mean, at some point, we're going to get consciousness and below that, there's no consciousness, and above that, there definitely is. And there's a sharp line because because the thought is, either the light of consciousness is on, or it's not. I mean, a light might be dim, but a dim light is still a light, and it's different from no light at all. And then he thinks, and this is this is the standard worry: if you're a physicalist about consciousness, you're going to have to think that consciousness is constituted by some sort of physical. Arrangement, who knows, global workspace, uh, 40 hertz, well, around 40 hertz oscillations, uh, 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 re-entrant loops, whatever. Uh, and uh, any physical state type that might constitute consciousness is surely going to admit of, of borderlines. I said 40 hertz oscillations, but it would be mad that exactly at 40 hertz you get consciousness and and uh, higher frequencies, lower frequencies uh, are different. So natural, natural uh, uh, inference is that consciousness is sharp. Any proposed physicalist reduction of consciousness is going to be uh, uh, vague at the borders. Uh, so consciousness can't be physical. And uh, that's kind of what Michael Tai infers. Michael Tai has become panpsychist in the face of this worry. Uh, panpsychists can say, uh, uh, no, there's no 
uh, 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 sharp borderline of the kind of physical movement because everything is conscious, and so the problem the problem goes away. I say that's 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 the wrong way. We should just admit that consciousness isn't sharp. It admits borderlines. It's quite it's quite uh, okay to say, look, it's indeterminate whether. Worms, I don't think worms are conscious. I mean, we'll come, we'll come back to this, but what, 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 what about that? wood lice, uh, lamprey. So I think it's indeterminate whether wood lice are conscious. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, with saying that. Uh, clear cases of consciousness, clear cases of non-consciousness, and there's going to be some in between, as with any, any concept that meets the borderlines, where there's no, no definite fact of the matter. And I'd attribute the, the contrary feeling either the light's on or there's not, to the intuitive plausibility of dualism, which I mentioned before. Most people addressing this question think that uh, there's some extra mind stuff that's present in the universe, right, exactly, in some places, but not others, and there's a clear division between the places where that extra stuff is there and where it's not. And that's why they think consciousness must be sharp, but that's all a mistake. There isn't any extra stuff, there's just all the physical stuff, and that's that's going to uh, allow borderlines. You might think. So I'm I, I, I'm denying that 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 there's consciousness. Uh, uh, Ty Ty looks at looks at this possibility. You deny uh, that consciousness is sharp, and he thinks that's a matter of denying consciousness. And I say no, no, I'm not denying denying consciousness. I just am denying dualist consciousness. My consciousness. Uh, is is perfectly capable of having borderlines, and, and here's an analogy that will make the position perhaps seem more obviously cogent. So, you might imagine asking, "Is life sharp?" And there was a time when many people would have said, "Yes, obviously it's sharp, because life requires the spark of a vital spirit, and either it's there or it's not." So. Yeah, and they, they would have been, you know, if they'd known about viruses, they would have thought, look, it's either there's, the, the, uh, it's a fact of the matter, either, either the, the, the vital spirit is present in viruses or it's not. And then they might have thought, well, any physical uh, reduction of life will have borderlines, and so, so uh, you can't do the physical reduction of life. But we don't draw the conclusion from that that. Uh, life isn't physical, we draw the conclusion that, no, life admits of borderlines, and the idea that, that there must be a sharp cutoff point is due to the mistaken idea that life admits of uh, extra, that life requires an extra vital spirit. So that's our position. No, we, we just straight off reductions about, about life. It involves certain kinds of physical processes. There's going to be borderlines. I really don't have a strong view about whether, whether viruses are, are alive, uh, but I don't have any inclination, having arrived at this position, to conclude eliminativism about life. Ah, life had to be sharp, we haven't got anything sharp, there is no life. Somebody who, who, who uh, responded to the modern view of life by saying, ah, we've discovered there is no life, there's just physical stuff, may be saying something, well, you know, you're looking at me slightly puzzled, I mean, indeed, I mean, that, would, that would not be a natural thing to say. So I say, what's happening with consciousness is just the same, and we've got absolutely no reason to say there is no consciousness, no more reason than there is to say there is no life. Okay, here's a different kind of indeterminacy, vagueness. So when we do consciousness research, we can talk about this more, but let's just take it as given that the, the first class methodology is, is how things go. We want to know which brain processes of consciousness, which, which are conscious, which ones aren't. And so we get subjects and we subject them to various tests and then we flash lights at them very fast and show them words and, 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 and we say, did you see it? Did you feel anything? Uh, and we think that if they say yes, that shows the state in question was conscious, and if they say no, it shows the state state wasn't. And, and we try and 
then identify what's common to all the known uh, the states where they say they were they were conscious. And 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 this is a, a pretty good research methodology. It, it, it turns out that something surprising me that we expected to be conscious turn out not to be conscious. It looks like the the information in my visual cortex that guides my hand when I lift that up. That's that's uh, uh, also stream information, and that's arguably not conscious. That's amazing. Uh, uh, it turns out that that uh, uh, what's going on in people who are given morphine after they've had a pain. This is Dan's example. Uh, 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 it's still conscious. Doesn't hurt, but it's still conscious. That, that's a surprise. You might have thought the morphine would make the pain go away, but the conscious pain go away. So, so we do discover a lot of interesting things by this kind of research. But there's some things that we aren't going to discover. So suppose we do manage to draw a line around the, the, the states in humans who, who are, are conscious in line with this methodology. So we discover that a certain kind of organization uh, is present always and only when people say they're conscious. So is it that organization that constitute consciousness? The, I've got here a, a, a structural property, or is it the organization being realized by human carbon-based chemistry? And this is this this looks like a pretty serious con question about what constitutes consciousness. I mean, is 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 it the intrinsic properties? I don't want to say intrinsic. I've been thinking about this intrinsic business, and I realize that there's all kinds of terminological confusion here. Is is it let's call it say, the strictly physical properties? Or is it just the structural properties? And there's, there's this famous episode of Star Trek, which somewhat embarrassingly, I have never seen. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I've seen all the original Star Trek and none of the millions of spin-offs. But I understand this commander data. He's, in the, he's, in the, he's, a, he's just, just like us, except he's made of, made of silicon or something. And right, he, he, he shares property S and, and doesn't have property C and this commander data uh, uh, conscious. Clearly, the research of the kind I've been talking about, going around asking humans are they conscious when they're conscious, isn't going to decide it because it tells us that either C or C, either S or S plus C constitutes consciousness, but it doesn't tell us which. It's no good asking commander data because, of course, he's going to say yes, even if he's not conscious. So there's a puzzle there. Which, which, which of these constitutes consciousness? I mean, we have a similar puzzle with, with, with uh, higher order. Uh, when people report, they don't just have some first order state, but they also have the state of representing that first order state in such a way as they can report. And so it's just the first order state, but the first order state plus the higher order state that, that constitutes consciousness. And of course, there's a huge amount of literature on this. Uh, 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 people worry about this, and they don't worry about the first one, but they do worry about the second one. Uh, and there's a no report paradigm, and it's very complicated, and perhaps perhaps it's not such a good case as the first one. But these are two cases where it doesn't look as if our ordinary consciousness research paradigms are going to be able to decide between quite different candidate uh, uh, physical properties that might constitute consciousness. I'm happy to say there's no fact of the matter here. I want to say our concept of consciousness, what's going on in me in these cases, isn't tight enough to decide the matter. I say nothing in the facts or our concept of consciousness decides whether commander data is conscious or not. Nothing, nothing in the, the uh, research into consciousness, all the information decides whether uh, uh, animals that lack higher order states like dogs are conscious or not. I mean, we still have that feeling. Surely there's a light on in commander data or not. Surely there's a light on in, in you know, I'm, 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 I'm allowed to use surely's in, in, in direct speech. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the, the bad people. Okay, good ding, ding, right. Okay, I'm, uh, uh, I'm putting the surely's in for, you know, uh, show what I think about them. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> the people who think you know, there's, there's an extra light will say look there's a fact of the matter about whether commander data has a light or not it might be very hard for us to tell 
that Shaul is a factual matter, I say, no, there's no, there's no light and there's no factual matter because of that. But you might think, this is tantamount to denying consciousness. If I really say there's no factual matter, well, there's command today, that whether he's conscious or not, surely I'm rejecting the whole notion. And I say not. And now I want another analogy. Imagine a, a, a traditional community that, that relies on oil from Wales, some community, traditional community up in the Arctic, and they get oil and they use it to, to light their, their dwellings and to grease their uh, sled runners and so on. And somebody starts wondering, look, does oil, to be oil, do you have to come from whales and have kind of whale DNA molecules in you? Or would anything that kind of had the same structural properties could be burnt in, uh, uh, create light, uh, grease the sleds and so on? Would that be, would that be oil? Does it need W uh, or, or does it just need S? W for whale, S for structure. They, they imagine you know, Star Trek oil. Somebody cleverly constructs stuff that's just like oil but out of different, different chemistry. Would that be... Would that be oil? Now, of course, these people would quite sensibly say, look, there's no fact of the matter here. I mean, uh, uh, we can, we can or delay that, lay that down. I mean, we, we just call this stuff oil. We, we didn't stop to think about whether, whether uh, we were acquiring whale constitution or just, just the, the, the functional properties. I mean, there might be. The sensible people in this community might say, look, there's some funny people over there. Say, no, no, if, if we had this Star Trek stuff, there's a question about, I mean, even after all the physical facts are fixed, there's a question about whether it's really got oil in it. But they, they would be, these people who said that, they would be kind of oil duelists. And uh, they'd be, they'd be uh, barking up the wrong tree. But note again that these people would have absolutely no real reason to be oil to this, they might say, look, we really haven't decided whether, whether we're talking about the, the whale, whale chemistry or we're talking about the structure. Yeah, let's just leave that open. But still, of course, there's oil. We're not going to stop talking about, oh, we're not going to say there's no oil just because we have this looseness in our terminology. So again, I say uh, it's an, an exact analogy of, of Commander, Commander Renko. Uh, there's no fact of the matter about uh, this, this uh, possible stuff, but that's no reason to stop talking about uh, uh, this stuff is oil, that stuff's not oil, and this person's conscious now and that person isn't. I want to make a little note here because this is going to become important later. The reason the community doesn't have any need to decide, decide between W and S as the thing that constitutes oil is that they, it's not going to make any difference. I mean, the same stuff will count as oil. I mean, they've only got the whale stuff around and, and all the bits of whale stuff are going to count as oil and things that aren't whale stuff aren't going to count as oil, whether they make W or S uh, the requirement for being oil. I mean, W, S, W and S are coextensive in the actual actual world. It's only when you start thinking about these imaginary situations where somebody might cook up this alternative that they might have to have a worry about deciding, yeah, I'm going to sell you some oil. Now they might want to know, is, is, are we going to count as oil or not? But, but since, since there isn't any of that funny stuff, they don't need to, to make any decision. And similarly, we don't make a, need to make a decision between the, the carbon-based chemistry and the structure since there aren't any commander datas around, I mean, maybe they will be quite soon, but right now there aren't. And, uh, and uh, so we don't have any trouble deciding who's conscious when and so on, even though we haven't decided between the chemistry and the structure. In, in fact, I understand there's a technical term for this. I had a paper on this kind of stuff 30 years ago and my colleague Chris says, aha, what you're saying is the concept is, is, is Determinate in extension, uh, because W and S are coextensive, we'll pick out the same stuff whichever whichever way you read the concept, but but indeterminate in intention. 
how it's going to apply to other possible non-actual worlds, what falls under the concept there in the broad term. Okay. Little moral interlude. Uh, you might be worrying that all this vagueness about consciousness is going to have unhappy moral implications. And the thought here would be, look, in order to decide, in order to know how to treat people, uh, how to treat certain creatures, do they have moral standing, we need to know whether they're conscious. And since I say there's no fact in the matter about uh, uh, whether uh, commander data is conscious or whether worms, wood lice, and amphibians are conscious, uh, uh, it seems to follow that I'm saying it's indeterminate about whether we should treat them morally or not. And you might think, surely that's wrong. Surely that's wrong. I mean, surely commander data. Uh, uh, it's not just arbitrary what we do with commander data. But here, here I'm with Keith. I mean, this point Keith made yesterday, and I, I, I actually feel quite strongly about this. I think we, we'll do far better to base our model reactions directly on knowing and reflecting on physical natures, rather than to make them wait on some supposed further question about whether the creatures are conscious. I mean, think about all the people who treat animals awfully on the supposed basis that they've got reason to think they're conscious, or people who I mean, maybe go the other way. I mean, uh, treat all animals very carefully on the precautionary principle that they might be conscious and they're getting things the wrong way around, it seems to me. We should just think about, as Keith did it yesterday, what structures do these animals have? Uh, what goes on in them? How do they work? Uh, I mean, do they think about the future? I mean, uh, do they have projects? Uh, 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 do they know about, can they identify other animals? I mean, stuff like that. Huh? And, and maybe when you do that, we'd get some reason to, to draw a sharper line when it comes to the borderlines. Maybe thinking about, I mean, don't ask if lampreys are conscious. I've got lampreys because they're the basic vertebrate, right? All vertebrates descend from those horrible uh, jawless eel-like things that look just like uh, Francois's, uh, I can't remember which one it was. It was a horrible, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, uh, Maybe when we know enough about lampreys, we'll say, I know, sure, we, 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 should, we shouldn't, be, shouldn't be too nasty. And when we know about, enough about worms, which really do have a very, very simple uh, neural system, we'll think that, that cutting them up is, is fine. But when it comes to commander data, it seems to me absolutely obvious that we don't need to think about whether he's conscious. It's perfectly obvious we have to treat him with moral respect. Uh, and I understand that's what the Star Trek writers come at the conclusion they have they came to. Uh, I haven't really thought very much about how morally does it matter if animals are capable of thinking about their own mental states, but it's an interesting question we might, might want to, to reflect on. So I think that, that so we might decide, I mean, in the case of commander data, we will decide, and maybe in the case of dogs, having reflected on the fact that they uh, have, have uh, first order states but not higher order states, you might say, yeah, they're, they're deserving moral respect. And then on the basis of that, we might conclude, oh, yeah, we should think of them as conscious. And again, it's perfectly clear. I said it's, you know, commander data only exists in possible worlds, but maybe in a few years' time, we'll have real commander datas. And, uh, uh, and I don't think there's any doubt that A, we'll conclude knowing enough about them. And we shouldn't be fooled too quickly, but once we do really know how they work and we think we're not being fooled, we'll conclude that they are capable of moral standing, they deserve moral standing, and then we'll probably conclude that they're conscious. We'll count them as conscious because we're counting them as moral beings. But notice how the line of argument is working. We're going from the physics or from the, the kind of non-conscious non facts to the morality and then making a conclusion that we're going to count them as conscious. We're refining our, our concept in a certain way because of the association with the morality. We're not trying to sharp, sharpen the concept of conscience before we address the moral question. And to repeat, I agree with Keith that that's the wrong way to go around things, and you will end up in a moral tangle if you try and decide the moral issues in that way. There was just a little moral interlude that's kind of independent of what else I'm going to say. Okay. 
So now I want to come to illusionism proper, having put these different kinds, these other kinds of indeterminacies to one side. And at this point, I think we need to think a little bit more about our concept of consciousness. So far, I've just been working with uh, the innocent concept of consciousness that I've got from Eric Switchgable via, via Francois. Uh, then it's just the everyday concept that we apply from extension by the obvious examples. Now, I'm taking it that illusionists, people who deny consciousness in that sense, of whom we only have one example here, Francois, uh, I take it that they don't, I mean, it's pretty obvious, they, I take it they don't think our concept of consciousness is just a concept of a certain kind of behavioral, physical, functional process. I mean, they don't think that our concept of consciousness is in Dave Chalmers' terms, a type A concept, the kind of concept that Mary would possess before her exposure. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm be interested in know what Dan thinks, because Dan, I take it, thinks that all our concepts of consciousness are of that type A kind, but okay, uh, fine. I mean, I, I, as far as I can see, Dan's not an illusionist in my sense, because I don't see how anybody who thinks our concepts of consciousness are like that would be in a position to deny that we're conscious. Uh, Clearly, we have all that physical, functional, uh, uh, behavioral uh, uh, stuff going on. So by type A standards, we're going to be conscious. So illusionists, somebody who denies consciousness, must be thinking of the concept of consciousness as requiring something more of consciousness. Now, perhaps they're thinking of the concept of consciousness as a phenomenal concept, the, 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 the supposed concepts that people like Mary acquire as a result of having experienced, perhaps we have a generic phenomenal concept, uh, the concept of this kind of thing, uh, uh, where we, we kind of uh, generalize over all the, all the experiences we have. Now, one possible route to illusionism, and this has kind of come up a little bit here and there, it was quite prominent at the beginning of Hedda's talk, a couple of things he said yesterday made me think he might be thinking this. And uh, some of the things I think Keith has written are more explicit about this. They will go from, it's a phenomenal concept. And now David Chalmers has some very sophisticated arguments that, that uh, draw from the fact it's a phenomenal concept and various assumptions about the nature of phenomenal concepts, that phenomenal concepts can't possibly refer to physical states. And maybe there's a line of argument, in fact, I'm not sure it goes through all that smoothly, that will say, well, if Dave's right, and phenomenal concepts can't possibly refer to physical states, and if all there are are physical states, then the phenomenal concepts have to refer to nothing. And uh, that's a possible route to the illusionist conclusion. I'm going to assume that's not what illusionists think. It's not what Francois thinks. And, and the reason uh, I'm going to assume this is because it seems to me they're going to be aligning themselves with assumptions in the line of thought that they don't want to be aligning themselves with. Uh, look, we, this is not the time to, to, to unpick all the, all the moves being made in the conceivability, possibility, two-dimensional argument, but I think what's working at the center of it, and uh, Philip Groff and Martina Nina Rumelin have been very, very insightful in putting this bit out. The bit that's doing the work is the idea that phenomenal concepts, thinking about uh, uh, mental states of our phenomenal concepts, must reveal all the essential properties of their reference. Anything that's constituted of the referent will be revealed in a phenomenal concept. And then the, the Chalmers argument goes, but it's not revealed that the mental states are physical, so they can't be physical. And you might want to think, if you're an illusionist attracted by this line of thought, do you really take seriously the idea that there's a form of thinking that's guaranteed to reveal all the essential features of its referent? Uh, Hedda, Hedda was kind of giving us some 
some ways of making that palatable, but uh, it doesn't strike me as particularly palatable. Um, and so I would advise uh, uh, illusionists uh, not to sup at that table. It's not with a very long spoon, without a very long spoon. So I'm going to take it that illusionists will do better to hold our everyday concept of consciousness has, has an implicit, well, now, now I'm in a tank. Uh, I, I, I put that uh, parenthesis in after Francois' talk because I was going to, I mean, I originally had explicit. I mean, we should assume that the phenomenal concept of uh, uh, consciousness, the, the, the everyday concept of consciousness has built in that, that somehow uh, it requires that consciousness is non-physical. And I put here, explicitly requires. But Francois very nicely said that, that that's, that's uh, 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 more explicit, more, more than the illusionist needs. The illusionist just wants to say it's built in, and it might be interesting that it's built in in a non-obvious way, as you have the, the example of pink, pink and orange. Uh, so the idea is that for some reason, uh, 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 we've got this concept of consciousness, everyday innocent concept of consciousness, that when we, when we uh, uh, poke it a bit, it, it becomes clear that it's, it's part of that concept that something can't be uh, uh, conscious if it's just physical. And I'm sort of sympathetic to this idea. I mean, I mentioned earlier that I've always taken it that uh, humans are intuitive dualists. For some reason, let's not worry too much uh, uh, why right now, uh, humans just take it to be obvious that conscious states are non-physical. They find it very hard to, to uh, 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 I should use, choose my words carefully here because maybe it's going to matter the difference with France, but they find it very hard to, to embrace the thought that, that uh, uh, conscious mental states are just, are just brain states. And I, I've, I've always talked about this persistent intuition of distinctions. I mean, I've, I've, I've argued that it's not something that's going to go, go away. I mean, I think of it rather like, I may be anticipating an exchange I'll have with France, and the, the thought that, that we move through time, that we're on, on the back of a moving now, and it takes us from our birth up to our, our death. And uh, I think that thought is just mistaken, confused, but I don't think human beings are going to stop having that thought. Uh, so, okay. So, so there is this idea that kind of has a grip on everybody's minds that, that uh, consciousness has to be non-physical. And now the issue is, should we regard that as an analytic built-in part of the concept or just as a synthetic add-on? Should we suppose, as Francois was arguing, that it's built into the concept, the innocent concept of consciousness, of consciousness, that conscious states have to be non-physical? Or should we say, no, no, it's not built in, uh, just as with life, it wasn't built in that life had to be non-physical. It's not built in, and it just so happens that as an extra thought, a synthetic thought that could be easily taken away from the concept, people think that it's non-physical. Okay, and this is the point at which I'm happy to say there's no fact of the matter. So I don't think that we're forced to the view that Keith endorsed yesterday, that we uh, 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 shouldn't deny consciousness. I'm perfectly open to the thought that uh, this thing, this extra requirement is built into our concept and uh, uh, therefore uh, uh, it would follow that we should deny consciousness. Uh, actually, I, actually, I think it's an open, I mean, I, I, look, it's not an open question. I think it's, it, it's, it's definitely indeterminate. I think there's no fact of the matter. So I don't think Francois's limitism is forced, nor do I think Keith's reductionism is forced. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm just making you a straw, a straw reductionist for the moment. Uh, go back to the whale oil society, right? And they had this stuff, and it was made of whale uh, 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 chemistry, and it also had a certain uh, uh, structural functional properties. And, and I pointed out they had no reason to decide uh, whether uh, oil, the term they used, they used to pick out this, this stuff, required just S or whether it required W as well, because just the same samples we picked out either way. I mean, th th there wasn't any Star Trek oil around to, to confuse them. 
okay, now consider our intellectual ancestors. And imagine that some smart anic back then asked, I mean, does, does consciousness just require whatever's going on when we function intelligent, intelligently and responsibly to our environment? But does it additionally require that we have some non-physical uh, states D inside our head orchestrating the show? Since our ancestors were all pretty confident in their dualism, uh, they just seen no reason to decide that issue. I mean, exactly the same states we picked out either way. I mean, there's, there's, as they thought it, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're all, the, all the kind of inert, uh, non-sentient states, and then they're the states uh, which can be picked out either by the requirement they're the states that, that orchestrate our intelligent behavior, or by the requirement that they're the states that do that, and in addition, have a non-physical nature. And, 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 and they would have thought it was, it was silly to, to address that issue. Uh, but now, and this is the crucial twist, we physicalists now need to decide this issue because we've now realized that contrary to what our ancestors thought, the actual world is one where the concept doesn't give clear answers. It's one of the worlds in the tent intention where the concept is indeterminate. We've discovered that the actual world is one of those. And now we have to choose in a way that's left open by our loose prior concept, which way to go. Uh, yes, we're conscious because we function responsibly. We've got all the criteria applied for consciousness. Or no, we're not conscious because consciousness requires uh, uh, something non-physical, and we don't have that. And I want to draw from this, this uh, 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 more history the conclusion that nothing in prior usage or the facts decides that. Uh, there really isn't anything to tell us whether to be reductionists and consciousness just reduces the physical goings on, or to be eliminativists and say consciousness requires something non-physical. I think the setup is absolutely common, not just in philosophy, but in science as well. I mean, imagine asking contemporary uh, physicists, look, is it constituted of atoms that uh, they be small, tiny particles, one, one sort for each element? Or is it constitutive not only that, but that they have nuclei? If it turned out that we'd all been confused and atoms don't have nuclei, would that mean there weren't atoms? And the scientists will say, what are you fussing about? Why do we need to decide this? That's not going to happen. That doesn't make any difference. Exactly the same things as atoms, whichever definition we require. Okay. You might imagine asking, asking uh, uh, geometers uh, in... Uh, uh, 1600s say. Is, is Euclidean part of the concept of straight line in addition to shortest distance between two points, uh, line taken by somebody, something with no forces on it? And they'd say, well, why are you asking? What does it matter? Exactly the same things we picked up either way. Except in that case, it turned out later on that we did have to decide. I take it in this case, uh, we decided yeah, they're straight lines, they're straight lines in uh, relativistic space, uh, they're just not Euclidean. And we get this question all the time. Was it part of the net definition of caloric that it was a fluid? The answer is yes, and we discovered that it wasn't a, that it wasn't a fluid yet, we said there's no caloric. Uh, is it part of the definition of phlogiston, that it's something emitted in combustion? Well, uh, we discovered that it's, uh, Nothing emitted in combustion, we decided there's no, no phlogiston. Is, is proportional to the amount of matter uh, constituted the notion of, of mass? Uh, when we discovered that, that uh, uh, mass, uh, relativistic mass, increases with velocity, uh, uh, it's not proportional to the amount of matter anymore. Uh, we said, no, that's not part of the definition of mass. We didn't eliminate mass. Is absolute rest at part of the notion of ether? I mean, it's not obvious why you had to have that. Why shouldn't we just think of the uh, uh, space time continuum as ether? Uh, but no, we decided that ether had the notion of absolute rest built in and so eliminated it. And in all these cases, science could go one way or the other. There's no, there's no uh, compulsion in either the prior concept or the facts 
to tell you whether to reduce or eliminate. Uh, uh, that is kind of uh, uh, underdefined concepts, under definition was harmless, while you thought the world was a certain way, you discover the world's a different way, and now the under definition has to be uh, uh, resolved. We have to refine our concept in one way or another. One ref refinement makes us eliminate, the other refinement makes us uh, reduce, and there's no fact of the matter about which way to go. Nothing forces us to go one way or the other. Uh, there's some quite interesting work which suggests that, that in the scientific case, what decides whether they reduce or eliminate, it's just whether the scientists uh, with the new ideas want to, want to distance themselves, wear revolutionary new people, or, or want to present themselves as just having a twist on what was there before. Now, I think we get the same in philosophy. I think there's quite a lot of cases that have the same structure. Uh, does free will just require that my, my actions are driven by my uh, beliefs and desires and character? Or does it require, in, in addition, that their determination transcends natural law? Our intellectual ancestors never bothered to answer that because they thought exactly the same thing. It, it can't both ways. Uh, but now, now uh, 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 we realize that nothing transcends natural law. So should we eliminate free will, the, the uh, hard libertarians? Or should we say, no, that wasn't required for free will, and we reduce it? And it's worth noting that when it comes to that question, Dan is a firm uh, reductionist, non-eliminativist. Uh, we've got all the free will we could care about. And you might wonder why somebody who goes that way on free will sometimes seems to be going the other way on consciousness. Those of you who were here at the, the workshop three weeks ago on on sensory experience and representation. It came at Laura Gar gave a very nice paper where she was arguing that the kind of representation that you get out of digital registers and the coloration of the environment, the kind of representation that, that Ruth Millikan has done so much to articulate. She said, that's not real representation. Uh, uh, that's just uh, 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 a sad thing. Real representation is is uh, uh, what you get determined by the internal structure of consciousness. Uh, she actually uh, 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 thinks that there isn't anything of that kind of uh, uh, determined by the internal structure of consciousness. So she was an eliminatorist about representation. And I said that, that's exactly the same structure. You might build into the notion of representation that it's something determined by the intrinsic structure of consciousness, but you don't have to. And uh, uh, in that case, I'm inclined to go the other way. So, I hope I made the point clear. I think that, that uh, is non-physicality part of the concept of consciousness or not? I don't think there's any fact of the matter. It's quite explainable why there shouldn't be any fact of the matter. It's in line with lots of other cases. Uh, and so, uh, whether we are reductionists or limitarists isn't forced on by the facts or our prior concepts. Let me see how I'm going to end. That's so I've always felt that the right response is to have the permissive notion of consciousness be a reductionist. Uh, 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 say there is consciousness, it's just not physical, rather than sound like an idiot and go around saying nothing is conscious, nobody is conscious. Uh, and and uh, and indeed, yesterday it turned out that Keith agrees. Uh, uh, don't, don't want to sound like an idiot. You kind of get people uh, worrying about the wrong point to go around saying. And, and uh, uh, Dan, Dan says now he's uh, 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 inclined to agree too. So that's all fine. Uh, well, so we're in the funny position. I'm more illusionist than them. Uh, At least to the extent that, right, we're all agreeing, you don't want to be an idiot, you're going to sound pretty odd if you go around saying nobody's conscious. But I've added the point. That this is merely a matter of rhetorical effectiveness. It's absolutely nothing in rationality, nothing in the facts, nothing in our concepts that forces us to that conclusion. It'd be perfectly acceptable to say there's no consciousness, but uh, perhaps uh, we're going to uh, win more, win more convert, converts if we don't. So I'm going to stop there.
Thank you.